In today's episode, we embark on a journey through the intricacies of the bustling communities that bring life and character to the pixelated landscapes of the game. Grab your pickaxe, prepare your trading emeralds, and join me on an expedition into one of these peaceful settlements. Villages are communities occupied by non-player characters known as villagers. These structures can be found scattered across a variety of biomes, including plains, deserts, savannas, taigas, and snowy plains, each showcasing unique architectural styles and materials that harmonize with their natural surroundings. There are houses, farmlands, stables, and wells in villages, and you can actually discover valuable early game resources and items within village chests. Villages also spawn cats, farm animals, and iron golems for defense. Villagers themselves exhibit distinctive appearances, which are influenced by the biome they originate from, adding further diversity to the game world. Swamp and jungle-based villagers also exist in the game, but villages don't naturally generate on those biomes. To observe these unique villager types, you'll need to take the initiative to transport villagers to these biomes and facilitate their breeding. When struck by lightning during thunderstorms, villagers turn into witches. And unlike zombie villagers, you cannot heal a witch back into a regular villager. When villagers are generated in villages, they can acquire one of the many available professions by taking ownership of a nearby workstation. Here are the blocks currently used by villagers to practice their chosen profession. A composter transforms them into farmers, a barrel aligns with fishermen, and a lectern designates them as librarians, just to name a few. Here's a complete list of possible professions and their corresponding workstation. When a villager's workstation is broken, they lose their profession and will look for unclaimed workstations nearby. If all nearby workstations are already claimed, they will remain unemployed. It's worth noting that not all villagers can partake in this system. There exists a particular type known as the nitwit villager. These peculiar individuals are easily distinguishable by their distinctive green outfit and they are exempt from adopting any profession. While engaged in their chosen vocations, villagers do not display any discernible visual cues of their work, apart from the sounds they generate while laboring at their respective workstations. The exception is the farmer who actually harvests and plants crops in village farmlands. They also craft bread from wheat and generously share their harvest with other villagers. This altruistic behavior not only nourishes the community, but also fosters a willingness to engage in the breeding process among villagers, a mechanic which will be explored in a bit. For villagers to permanently retain their profession, they have to be traded with by a player at least once. Initiating contact with a villager is as simple as right-clicking on them, which opens up a trading interface displaying a selection of available trades. Villagers progress through five career levels, starting as novices and working their way up to becoming masters. While the pool of trades they offer is linked to their profession, the diversity of available trades expands as they ascend the career ladder. Successful trades grant experience points to both the player and the villager, which the villager uses to fill the trading bar. Once this bar is completely filled, the villager levels up in their career, unlocking new trade options. The initial trades of novice villagers are random, but are directly related to their profession assigned by their claimed workstation. Once they've engaged in a trade, they are permanently tied to their profession, even if their workstation is removed. They can still continue trading without their workstation, but their ability to provide goods will stop unless they locate a new valid workstation to replenish their trades. All villager trades involve emeralds, and the recommended strategy to acquire emeralds is by trading with them, not mining. A villager's career level is indicated in the trading menu, and is visually shown by a badge near their belts, stone for novices, iron for apprentices, gold for journeymen, emerald for experts, and diamond for masters. 
The prices of items offered by villagers can fluctuate, with lower prices becoming available when you have established a positive reputation with the villagers. As mentioned in previous episodes, there are items in the game that can only be obtained by trading, like the mending book from librarians. It's impractical to discuss the very long list of available trades from each villager profession, but I'm posting a link down in the description for your reference. Farmers buy and sell crops and farm products and they can sell golden carrots for less than 3 emeralds under the right discount rules. Fishermen can sell you enchanted fishing rods and butchers trade meat products. Librarians sell various enchanted books and name tags. Armorers, toolsmiths, and weaponsmiths trade enchanted armor pieces, tools, and weapons. Shepherds buy colorful dyes and wool, while leather workers can sell you saddles. Clerics can turn rotten flesh to emeralds and sell you redstone, lapis lazuli, glowstone, and ender pearls. Masons can buy your stone blocks for emeralds, perfect for decongesting your storage spaces. Cartographers can sell you maps to locate woodland mansions or ocean monuments. Fletchers can turn sticks into emeralds and are easy source of arrows, enchanted bows, or crossbows. Trading with villagers is a lucrative business, enabling you to amass emeralds, enchanted books, and non-renewable materials if you can master the art of lowering trade prices. Villager populations can expand through natural breeding. For this to occur, two specific conditions must be met. First, there should be at least one unclaimed bed for a new occupant. And second, at least two villagers should have enough food in their inventory. As mentioned earlier, farmers in a village can start sharing and distributing food around. You can also drop any of the following food items near villagers to ensure they have enough food in their inventories. Once the two conditions are met, villagers become willing to breed indicated by hearts floating upwards, and a baby villager soon appears. During their infancy, baby villagers cannot take on specific job roles. Instead, they prefer to explore their surroundings, often found running around, and occasionally jumping on beds. After approximately 20 minutes, they will mature into adults. The appearance of baby villagers can adopt their present biome or one of the parent's appearance. Villagers also have a mechanic called gossiping, which influences trade prices and disposition of naturally spawned iron golems. Essentially, good deeds towards villagers, like being a hero of the village or curing zombie villagers, contributes positively to your reputation. Conversely, harming villagers will send your reputation plummeting, causing trade prices to soar. If enough gossip is passed around of your bad deeds, iron golems can attack you. They do hit very hard, being the second strongest melee attack mob in the game. Iron golems serve as defenders and guardians of villages. They move slowly as they patrol the dirt roads, but can deal significant damage to hostile mobs, swinging their heavy iron arms to throw enemies up in the air. Iron golems are generated with the creation of the village, but additional golems can be summoned by villagers when threatened. When three villagers band together and perceive a lack of nearby protection, they can spawn an iron golem. This process requires that the villagers have previously rested in their beds and that no existing iron golem is nearby. Iron golems show cracks in their texture to indicate damage by enemies and they can be repaired by right-clicking iron ingots on them. When killed, Iron golems drop iron ingots and occasionally poppies. While the specifics of iron golem spawning are quite complex and are the foundation of many iron golem farms, such details extend beyond the scope of this basic guide series. Players have the option to create their own iron golems by assembling four iron blocks in a T-shaped configuration and placing a carved pumpkin atop the central iron block. 
crafting iron blocks requires 9 iron ingots each, while carved pumpkins are obtained by using shears on a regular pumpkin. Player-made iron golems do not become hostile toward players, even with a negative villager reputation, and they refrain from retaliating when harmed. While they primarily serve as protectors for villagers, iron golems typically engage most hostile creatures, with a few exceptions like the creeper. Villagers are natural targets of zombie and illager variants, and they will flee and attempt to summon iron golems for protection if under threat. If a villager gets bitten and killed by a zombie, the villager can turn into a zombie villager. The chance of becoming a zombie villager is 100% in hard difficulty and 50% in normal difficulty setting. Zombie villagers can also be spawned by the game naturally. To reverse the zombification of a villager, you can take the following steps. First, trap the afflicted zombie villager then, throw a splash potion of weakness on them, and finally, feed them a golden apple by right-clicking on the zombie villager. After a few minutes, the once zombified villager will make a full recovery, returning to their regular villager state. These healed villagers extend special discounts exclusively to the player who nursed them back to health. In the current version of the game, you can heal a villager several times, but they only give a big discount the first time. No further discount is applied after the first curing. Killing zombie villagers does not affect your reputation with regular villagers. As discussed in previous episodes, killing a pillager captain bestows upon you the bad omen status effect, which triggers a raid if you enter any village. This player triggered event is displayed on top of the screen as a boss bar to indicate its progress. Raids unfold in successive waves, primarily composed of illagers launching attacks on the village. Each subsequent wave introduces more illagers than the previous one. The number of waves varies based on the game's difficulty setting with 3 waves for easy, 5 waves for normal, and 7 waves for hard difficulty. If a player's bad omen status effect reached level 2 or higher, the game adds an extra wave. Higher levels of bad omen also increase the likelihood of raid mobs spawning with enchanted weapons, making them stronger and potentially more dangerous to deal with. Illagers involved in raids can run faster and may receive support from witches armed with splash potions. The boss bar displayed during a raid can hint the remaining number of illagers to defeat before progressing to the next wave. If you encounter difficulty locating illagers, ringing the village bell can help highlight their positions. When engaging in raid battles, it's advisable to carry potions of regeneration, healing, swiftness, and strength to effectively dispatch your adversaries. For instructions on crafting these potions, you can refer to our previous guides. Illagers can open and even destroy doors in villages to kill targets. They also destroy beds to invalidate the village. In the unfortunate event that all villagers are slain, the raid culminates in defeat. However, if you successfully defend the village and vanquish all raid mobs, you are rewarded with the hero of the village status effect. This positive effect prompts villagers to celebrate with fireworks, offer you discounts on trades, and express gratitude by showering you with various trade items as gifts. The vexes you see here don't count as raid mobs, even though they were spawned by participating evokers. Rarely, you can come across villages with cobwebs and grimy glass panes. The houses have no doors and the village has no torches. These are zombie villages and are occupied by zombie villagers. As you explore these eerie locales, consider preparing splash potions of weakness and golden apples for the opportunity to transform these afflicted villagers back into their original forms. 
You can leave these villages for now because the inhabitants will not despawn, but they can burn in sunlight if they try to pursue you. Before we end this episode, it's worth mentioning another intriguing character in the game, similar in appearance to villagers, but leading a nomadic existence. The wandering trader can randomly spawn near a player together with two leashed trader llamas. They sell a variety of items and you'll be needing emeralds to trade with them. They disappear after two Minecraft days and just wander aimlessly around during daytime. At night, they drink potions of invisibility to elude zombies. Should you find yourself in need of their leashes, please refrain from harming them. Instead, use boats to capture the trader llamas and subsequently release their leads. We've explored the dynamics of trading, the importance of potions during raids, and the potential for customizing and expanding villages to create your own unique settlements. Whether you're a seasoned player or new to the game, villagers offer countless opportunities for exploration, creativity, and adventure. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Expen Sage. Stay tuned for more exciting adventures and insights in future episodes.